The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the people whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Sakhalin, sore point of the Pacific. conflict between Russia and Japan started on the island of Sakhalin. From Sakhalin, it spread to the Asiatic mainland. For more than a century now, Sakhalin has been the scene of clashes between the Russians and the Japanese, of bullying and armed aggression, of treaties, of suffering and bloodshed and massacre. Today again, Sakhalin is a sore point of Soviet-Japanese relations. <laughs> was startled just a month ago when on the same day both Soviet Russia and Japan made radio announcements concerning Sakhalin. The Soviet Union, in what may be its biggest diplomatic victory of the war, has forced Japan to surrender coal and oil concessions in Sakhalin Island, north of Japan. This announcement came as a bombshell. On the same day, Tokyo announced. The new agreement with Moscow has further bolstered friendly relations between Japan and the Soviet Union. It is especially significant that the agreement was reached on a basis of mutual concessions and that it has brightened relations between the two powers. The conflict between Russia and Japan on the Pacific today is an extension of the same conflict that has smoldered on Sakhalin since the middle of the last century. Russia emerged from the Napoleonic Wars as the dominant power in Europe. In 1847, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia called in his advisers. What we must see, Your Majesty, is that England has become a dangerous rival of Russia in the Far East. Yes, sir, Count Nesselrod. England has not only opened up five Chinese ports to British trade, but by taking Hong Kong, she has gained a predominating influence in the Yangtze Valley of China. Do you take this to mean that England uh, might move northward and take control of the mouth of the Amur River? If she did con gain control of the mouth of the Amur River, Russia's position on the Pacific would be untenable. Uh, that uh, would be disastrous. Yes, Your Majesty. I have been concerned about uh, Russia's interests in the Far East now for some time. Strong and definite action is necessary now, Your Majesty. Yes, and I have made up my mind. That will be a welcome decision. I shall send Governor Muraviov of Tula to be Governor General of uh, Siberia. Muraviov? Yes. Muraviov is a strong and energetic man. But, Your Highness, Muraviov is only... cannot be more than 38 years old. Muraviov is an outstanding administrator. Yes, Your Majesty. But would Your Majesty appoint Muraviov over the heads of all the older officials? Muraviov is a man with vision, Count Nesselrode. A builder. It is my order that Muraviov be set up as Governor General at Irkutsk, with authority over all the territory between the Yenisei River and Bering Straits. You would make all of it. Muraviov and his staff went from the Russian capital at St. Petersburg to Irkutsk in Siberia. In his staff was a brilliant young naval officer, Nivelskoy. They talked long of Russia's future on the Pacific. And after they had arrived in the Russian Far East, Muraviov fitted out Nivelskoy in an expedition and sent him to explore the Siberian coast from the Bay of Tuga down to the mouth of the Amur River. Nivelskoy returned with a startling discovery. You see here? Look at this map, Your Excellency. Yes. 
It has always been thought that Sakhalin was a peninsula. Yes, Nabelsko. Yes. But it is not a peninsula. Sakhalin is an island. An island? Yes, Your Excellency. There are straits here between Sakhalin and the mainland. But Krusenstern, 45 years ago, explored these waters and said that Sakhalin was a peninsula. But it is not. It is an island. The Gulf of Tartary you see here on the map hmm. is connected with the mouth of the Amu River. That means that the Amu River is accessible from the south as well as the north. Yes, sir. And not only that, but the Amur is navigable for seagoing vessels. That is true. It will have a far-reaching effect for Russia in the Far East. We have confirmed it, Your Excellency. And we must take steps at once. I must go back to St. Petersburg at once. I must advise the Tsar and inform him that we must act. Muravyov went back to St. Petersburg. He informed Tsar Nicholas I and Foreign Minister Nesselrode of Nivelskoy's discovery and suggested immediate developments. No, Governor Muravyov. Your schemes are not consistent with the present political situation in Europe. Our situation with England has become graver since you left for the Far East, Governor. I am aware of that, Your Majesty. We must avoid all entanglements in the Far East. No entanglements are necessary, my dear Count Nesselrode. Before I left Siberia, I gave Nebelskoy instructions to found a Russian settlement at Petrovskoy in the Bay of Happiness. You gave Nebelskoy instructions? There is no time to waste, Count Nesselrode. Your Majesty, it is imperative that we avoid all such adventures. We cannot afford to become embroiled in any such adventures at this time. It is a matter of extreme danger. Governor Muravyov, that you have acted in good faith is apparent. However, the situation has changed. Your Majesty, and... forgive my intrusion, but I have an important communication for Governor General Muravyov. Give it to him. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, it is from Nabelskoy. Nabelskoy? Yes. May I beg leave to read it now, Your Majesty? By all means. Your Majesty, all St. Petersburg is on edge because of the delicate situation with England. The repercussions from founding a Russian settlement on the Pacific would complicate our relations still more. England has become uh, Russia's principal rival. Your Majesty, Nevelskoy has sailed up the Amu River with six sailors and one gun and has established a post 20 miles from the estuary. Is that at uh, Petrovskoy? No, Your Majesty. He says that he found the Bay of Happiness icebound. So he sailed up the Amur River and established the post of Nikolaevsk, which he named after you, Your Majesty. He has exceeded his orders. He acted on his own initiative, Count Nesselrode. Your Majesty, this is folly. Is uh, Nevelskoy holding this new settlement now, Governor? Yes, Your Majesty. The native Gilyaks flocked to see him land, and he ordered them to swear allegiance to the Russian crown. Nevelskoy should be court-martialed for his disobedience. Your Majesty, Nevelskoy is a brilliant and able officer. He acted in the interests of Your Majesty in Russia. He has raised the Russian flag over Nik Nikolaevsk. Ah, he has raised the Russian flag there? Yes, Your Majesty. I demand that Nikolaevsk be abandoned at once. No. Nikolaevsk must stand. And herewith, I pardon Nevelskoy. Where the Russian flag has once been hoisted, it must not be lowered. <laughs> Nevelskoy was made an admiral for his audacity. He built Nikolaevsk into a city, then explored all the Amur River region. Now he looked across the Tartary Straits to Sakhalin, the island he had discovered. He sailed across, anchored at the largest native settlement on the island, took possession of it, and named it Muravyevsk for his enterprising boss, Muravyev. And here, the first conflict with the Japanese arose. Interfering with our commercial relations with the native people of Sakhalin. We have information that you Japanese have been trying to stir up the Ainu people against us. You will not succeed. We hold the interest of the Ainu people uppermost. The Ainu people of Sakhalin can trade with whom they wish. We Japanese traded with them first. Well, I call your attention of all Japanese to this official statement issued by me. In accordance with the Treaty of Nerchinsk, concluded between Russia and China, the island of Sakhalin, being a prolongation of the basin of the Amu River, incontestably belongs to Russia. The bickerings went on, year after year. A clash of the same kind developed between Japan and Russia over the Kuril Islands, stretching northward from Japan to Kamchatka. At last, the Russians proposed that the Japanese should take over all the Kuril Islands and that the Russians should take all of Sakhalin. 
It was agreed. But Russia little realized how deeply she had antagonized Japan. While the loss of Sakhalin rankled in Japan, the Russians converted the dismal island into a prison. At first, ordinary convicts, felons were sent there. Later, political prisoners, cultured gentlemen were also sent there. Sakhalin became a desolate island of suffering and misery. But what have I done? You had best learn, Karonian, that you are no longer in St. Petersburg. You are a convict. I am not a convict. I am a political prisoner sent here because... Keep your mouth shut. I was sent here because the influential men around this As long as you're in my charge, Karonian, you will be treated as the other prisoners are treated. You cannot keep me here. In case you're thinking of escape, remember the nearest court of appeals is 4,000 miles away across the wilderness. A long walk. You make a beast of a man here. I have been chained to a wheelbarrow for months, and now you... Hold your tongue. I will not hold my tongue. You and your kind are trying to silence me, but you will never... Borowski, yeah. give this man the plate. Come on, Karonian. No. The plate will teach you some manner. No. Come no, you me. cannot flog yeah. me again. No. No, you cannot. Warden, this man Karonian has done nothing. He is a convict. But he's such a frail man. And that heavy rawhide whip will kill him. He will learn to behave as a convict. But you must not now. Oh. Through the years it was a Russian prison island, the Japanese never took their eyes off Sakhalin. In less than 30 years, they were at Russia's throat in the Russo-Japanese War. Japan emerged as a world power. And when the Treaty of Portsmouth was at last signed, Russia had surrendered the southern half of Sakhalin to Japan. This southern half of Sakhalin, the Japanese called Karafuto. The main value of Karafuto is its forests and fisheries. Herring is our most important catch. There is very little oil in Karafuto, but there are large quantities of a coal. Is it true that Japanese experimental plants have been trying for years to distill oil from coal? Oh, it is just one of our interests in developing the resources of our Karafuto. Well, are the Japanese army and navy interested in this experiment? In a passing way. Now, over here, we are experimenting with the development of hard wheat. And this is very... In Karafuto, as in other Japanese territories, the research was carefully guarded. At the close of World War I, Japan and the United States and several other allied nations sent troops to Siberia. Each nation agreed to send 7,000 men, but Japan sent 72,000. When the troops of the other nations left Siberia in the spring of 1920... Something funny here. You American troops are leaving, but the Japs are staying on. Yes, Winthrop. And they brought eight times as many troops over here as we did. Ah, uh, looks to me that they plan to stay. Yes, and not only that. They've been helping the anti-Bolshevik movements of Kalmykov and Semyonov. Well, there's a lot of bad blood between the Japs and the Red Partisans. Yes, and it's not going to get any better. Well, there's been quite a few outbreaks between Russian nationals and the Japs. The war is over, and they want the Japs to get out. I'm thankful, Winthrop, that we American troops don't have the job of throwing the Japs out of Siberia. <laughs> well, I'd like to be going back to the States with you, but I've got an assignment to stay here. My publisher seems to have a hunch that there's going to be something doing up there in Siberia. Well, I've got to go now. See you back in the States when you get back. Yeah, <laughs> if I get back. So long, Winthrop. So long. Meantime, the Red Forces had taken over Nikolaev. The settlement that Nevelskoy had founded on his own initiative three quarters of a century before. But the Japanese were also in Nevelskoy. The Japanese maintained a friendly attitude toward the Russians. I have asked you to come in, General Ishikawa, because you are chief of the Japanese garrison here. Yes, General Priyapitsa. Uh, General Ishikawa, you, uh, you wish friendly relations with us? Of course. Then why are you maintaining guards around the stores and warehouses and near my own staff headquarters here? I assure you that it is only in the interest of order, General Priyapitsin. I'm informed that some of your guards, when they are relieved from duty, hide inside our stores and warehouses. What? That is contrary to orders. 
You can see for yourself that my troops and your troops are on the best of terms. Some of my troops even wear red ribbons pinned to their uniforms. Mm-hmm. And many of my troops have said that when you march on Khabarovsk with your red troops, that they would like to go along and help you. Oh. We are the friends of Russia. Thank you for coming in, General Ishikawa. I trust that our present relations will continue. But General Triapitsin had misgivings. On March 11th, 1920, he ordered the Japanese to surrender their arms. The day passed, and the Japanese made no move to give them up. That night, the American correspondent, Winthrop, slept with his clothes on. And in the black of night at 2.30 a.m. Uh, hey, hey, Ivan. Uh, Ivan. Uh, uh, yes, Winthrop? Uh, what's that shooting out there? Uh, uh, sounds like grenades and machine guns and rifle fire. Put on your boots, Ivan. Let's get over to staff headquarters. Yes, wait for me. Wait for me. Come on, Ivan. We've got to find three of Shooting is down around the staff headquarters. Yeah, it looks like the place is on fire. Hurry. Oh, there's three of Pizzi. Where? Flying right over there. Yeah. Uh, he's shot. Come on. General Piapichin! General Piapichin! They... They killed Nauma. And they set the headquarters on fire. Uh, where'd they get you? In the leg. Oh... Japanese attack with no warning. Come on, Ivan. We've got to get General Triapitsin to some help. He's badly wounded. Oh, those Japanese. They'd kill him if they found him. Uh, give me a hand, Ivan. Yeah. Uh, oh, come on, General. Oh, we'll pick you up they... and get you back. As I write this, the fighting is still going on. The Japanese have occupied the western and central parts of Nikolaev. Comrade Boudrin has arrived with reinforcements, and the Red Partisans are now carrying the fight through the streets to the Japanese. Houses occupied by the Japanese are being set afire. General Ishikawa is in this store with his troops. Yes, he's either going to have to surrender or be burned to death. Hey, look, what's that? Well, it's a squad of Japanese troops coming out of the fire. Hey, that's Ishikawa himself, leading them straight for us. Yes, but the orders are coming on. Fire! 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 The fighting is still going on in Nikolaevsk. General Ishikawa and all the troops with him in the Shimada store were killed when they charged out of the blazing building. The fighting is now centering around the Japanese consulate. The Reds today tried to negotiate with the Japanese, besieged in the consulate, but the Japanese fired upon them. The consulate is now on fire and surrounded by the Reds. They try to come out and make a counterattack here, as they did at the Shimada store. Oh, they may commit suicide in there, Major. They have their choice of coming out and surrendering. What about all the documents in the consulate? Wouldn't they be very valuable to the Red? They would. But you can be sure that before those Japanese are destroyed, they will destroy the documents. All of them. Japanese never came out. And now the Russians in Nikolaevsk on the mainland and on Sakhalin across the Tartar Strait knew that as soon as spring came, the Japanese fleet would come. At Alexandrovsk on Sakhalin, they kept a constant watch. Warships are visible on the horizon south of Alexandrovsk. We think they're Japanese. Wait for further orders. The warships have been identified as Japanese. It is a Japanese war fleet. An icebreaker is coming ahead of them, cutting through the ice of the Tartar Straits. Inform the population of your district. A Japanese landing force is disembarking at Alexandrovsk. The Japanese are marching in columns toward the city. I'm speaking from the radio station. One column is marching toward us here. The members of the executive committee of Zakhalin are preparing to march out of Alexandrovsk. We have informed the population that if any of them wish to retreat northwards of our detachment, they... The Japanese had taken over all of Sakhalin, and for five years they held the entire island and negotiated when and as they pleased with the Soviets. 
Now the shoe was on the other foot. Japan called the tune. At last, the negotiations were over. The last Japanese soldier has left Russian Sakhalin, and this northern half of the island again belongs to the USSR. But, uh, Petroviev, the Japanese uh, civilians will be with you for a long, long time to come. You are referring to the oil concession? Well, that was the condition of the Japanese moving out, wasn't it? Well, partially, Mr. Winter. It's my understanding that Russia granted the Japanese the right to exploit half the established oil fields of Russian Sakhalin for a period of 45 years. This may not be as bad a deal as it appears. We have possession of the northern half of Sakhalin, and many things can happen in 45 years. The Japanese soldiers left northern Sakhalin, but the Japanese civilians stayed. Oil wells went up, and tons and tons of Russian oil went to Japan. For years, Japan had been in quest of oil the greatest of the essential materials for industry in peace, and still more valuable in war. In 1925, Japanese were outspoken about their deal. Japan is no dreamer of dreams, Mr. Winthrop. Uh, would you say, Mr. Kawakami, that this uh, Sakhalin deal was inspired by a hope of uh, federation of Asiatic peoples? It would be hypocritical to deny that the thing that has induced Japan to restore friendly relations with Russia is the prospect of getting the oil of northern Sakhalin. Uh, Japan is realistic. There is little oil in Japan, and so far, little has been found in Korea and in Manchuria. Therefore, it is natural that Japan should turn to Russia's vast eastern territories. Uh, this uh, Sakhalin oil deal could mean future trouble with Russia. Couldn't it, Mr. Kawakami? Trouble is always a possibility. But historically... Japan has reason to rejoice because we have never given up the belief that the whole island of Sokolin once rightfully belonged to Japan and that we were cheated out of it by Russia. This was Japan's attitude in 1925. They not only secured the oil from their own wells, but they also bought much of the oil from Russian wells in northern Sokolin. Oil wells mushroomed up out of the wilderness, and new people came in, many of them. Hello. Zakovyev, I'm so glad to see you. Ah, we have great need of men like you here on Sakhalin, Osnikov. Did you have a good voyage? <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> and such a cool ship. Other oil workers besides you came? Oh, yes, yes. Field workers and engineers from the Caucasus oil fields and fishermen from the Volga and the Caspian. Ah, good. And we brought tools and tractors and machinery as much as the ship could hold. Do you need them? <laughs> need them? <laughs> we need everything. Ships have been coming in one after another with new people, experts, laborers, technicians, engineers. And yet we need more. We need books and teachers and medicine, doctors and microscopes and cement and post oil diggers. But a great deal has already come here. Uh, we need more, much more. For here in Sakhalin, we're working out not only our own destiny, but march of the destiny of Soviet Russia on the Pacific. In 1925, when the Soviets regained control of northern Sakhalin, the population was 10,000. In the next 10 years, it had increased 10 times. Soon, the Russians were taking as much oil out of northern Sakhalin as the Japanese. Under their agreement, they sold part of this oil to the Japanese. In 1933, they sold the Japanese half of their output. But the situation was changing. You are putting in another pipeline here? Um, uh, yes. It appears that the pipeline is going down under the sea. Um, yes, it, it is. Across the Tartar Strait to the mainland? Yes. Did you not build the pipeline from the east coast of the island over here? to the west coast, so that tankers could load oil here at Moscovo and carry it across the strait and up the Amu River to Habros? Um, that was the idea. Oh. And we've been shipping oil from here across the strait for some time. Was not uh, the shipping across the strait satisfactory? A pipeline under the sea is not hampered by the freezing of the strait. It seems that uh, more and more oil is being sent into Siberia. More and more oil is being sent into Siberia. You Japanese know as well as we know 
that Asiatic Russia is being industrialized. That means we need more oil. And that is the reason we are building the big refinery at Karabarov. Oh, indeed. Is that the reason there is less oil from your wells to sell to us? You still are operating your concession wells here in Sakhalin. But the oil production from your wells is greater than ours. You are well informed, Yoshizawa. Well informed. Japan still had its own oil concession in northern Sakhalin, scheduled to run until 1970. But in 1941, on the occasion of the signing of the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact, Japan agreed to liquidate her North Sakhalin concession within six months. But two months later... Hitler has attacked Russia. The Nazis are storming into the Soviet. The German invaders are sweeping the Reds before them. We'll be feeling the effects of Hitler's invasion right here on Sakhalin. It's 5,000 miles away, yes. But now that the Nazis are at Russia's throat, the Japanese are not going to give up their oil concession in six months, as Matsuoka agreed. The Japanese know that Russia is in no position to throw them out of Sakhalin. The Japanese stayed on beyond the six months. Beyond a year, two years. But meantime, Russia had thrown back Hitler, and the United States was closing in on Japan's outer empire. Meantime, Russia had become strong, and in March 1944... Soviet Russia has required Japan to surrender immediately all oil and coal concessions in northern Sakhalin, terminating the Japanese concession 26 years before its expiration. This is interpreted as a triumph of Russian diplomacy and an indication of Russia's rising might in the Pacific. The impact of the event echoed throughout the world. The Japanese had an answer. The oil and coal production in North Sakhalin has fallen off since the peak years. So the giving up of the oil rights to the Russians at this time does not bring much loss on our part. To this, the Russians replied, We have now forced from our soil the last of concessions wrung from us by foreign powers during the early days of reconstruction of our Soviet Union. You have just heard the story of Sakhalin, sore point of the Pacific. The first of two broadcasts dealing with the conflict between Russia and Japan in the Pacific. Next week, over many of these same stations, we will present the story of the long-standing friction between these two far eastern powers on the mainland of Asia. Listen next week for The Case of Russia versus Japan. You have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. It took a war to make us realize how close-knit the world is. When war split our families apart, when it rationed food and tires and gas and necessities of life, we began to feel a kinship with others thousands of miles removed, to the east, the west, the north, and the south. Now we are relearning our geography every time we hear world news. We're impatient to get that news, but we want it accurate and unbiased. So we tune radios to familiar stations, which have proved themselves through the years to be alert, truthful, enterprising, and world coverage. NBC and its affiliated independent stations bring you the expert reporting of correspondents who travel with their microphones to both home and battlefront. They do it by day and by night, so that Americans, wherever they may be, can be the best-informed people on Earth. written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gene Whitman. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>